Hi guys, welcome to my tutorial on multiple exposure in photography and specifically using Photoshop. For those of you that don't know, multiple exposure is a technique that goes back um, quite a number of years now to the likes of people like Harold Edgerton, um, who basically pioneered the technique using the flash. He actually invented the flash, quite interestingly, um, and he, in his early photographs of gymnasts and sports people, he was able to, to use a film, rewind the film back and take the photograph on top of the, the still. This would all be kind of automated. Um, and as you can see, the results are that you have semi-translucent images uh, on top of one another to show the path of movement. OK, this is a technique that has been picked up on uh, by Stephanie Young for her city photography. Um, as you can see, when this page eventually does load, Brilliant. <laughs> um, Stephanie Young uh, is quite a well-traveled photographer. She will take photographs in various different cities, including this one in Times Square. Uh, it's likely that she'll up the, the vibrance, the saturation, uh, as well as maybe sharpening her images a little bit. Okay, so without further ado, let's just see how we would go about doing this. Now, interestingly, um, I went to Times Square myself maybe about five or six years ago. And on my old potato of a phone, I was able to take images like these. Um, and I'm going to be putting these together to show you the results. Um, in another life, I was also a flare bartender, believe it or not. If you're lucky at the end of this video, I might show you the link to where this video is. And I've taken stills of the video in different places of me juggling in front of some customers. And that is the final result with a little bit of color pop that I will show you. And finally, I'm also going to show you how to go about cutting out individual elements and layering them on top of each other with varying degrees of opacity. So let's get stuck into the Times Square piece then. So let me just go back into my history. You can see maybe a little bit of what I did here. It is involved pasting a couple of different photographs in. Now, it's very important that when you paste the photographs in, that they don't show much difference between one another. We go to these three layers here, you can see there's very slight camera movements um, other than say the bottom layer, which was perhaps a little bit further back and a slightly different time of day. The reason why I've included that is I feel like the colors on here will offer something to the final composition. Okay, so when you have your three images on top of each other, let me just reveal them again. Um, this will of course been done by using the select all copy and paste function. Uh, you want to go to the opacity function over here. It's really simple. Um, it just determines like how see through a layer is and you just want to play around with this and you know, see what kind of results that you get from it. There's no kind of like guide to what a perfect composition looks like for this. Um, so long as we kind of get that feeling of movement that Stephanie Young wanted to achieve. She was interested in kind of um, showcasing how busy uh, and active the various different cities were. So let's try and get a feel for this in my work now. now. If you're not happy with the way that things are in terms of like the layout and the position of things, you do know that of course you can just use your move tool and the show transform controls and we can maybe change the position of things a little bit. I'm relatively happy so I'm not going to actually be doing this but that's just something that you may want to try and mess around with with your own compositions. Okay, so let's just go back on my history to avoid that. Um, when you are relatively happy, you can maybe start to look at doing individual um, kind of like layer properties. You may want to use the layer styles up here or for me personally, for the layer adjustments rather. For me personally, I like to just go straight for the image adjustments menu because you will have seen that I've been using this history bar and over the course of my last few videos, you can see that it goes, it gets exhausted after a little while and you kind of like you, you lose track of your progress. I understand that a few of you might be saying like, why don't you just use like use these functions over here or use layer masks and things like that. Well, yeah, I'm likely to do that in future videos. That's not a problem at all. However, um, for the sake of a short video where you can go back in your steps, I'd rather do it like this. OK, so let's go maybe look to up the vibrance. In fact, I'm going to be doing that on my background layer because I think there is a little bit more blue in here. I think there is. Yeah. So I'm going to be up in my um, vibrance my saturation 
let's just take a look at Stephanie Young's work and as you can see you know, it is quite a high contrast image that we're working with here both in terms of colour and tone let's get that back up and as you can see the blues are starting to come through a little bit more now what I didn't do before for my other image is I did not do uh, colour balance but I think that that might be useful now let's have a look at colour balance you can find it control and B for your reference um, I think that it would benefit these images if I went a little bit more blue and if I went a little bit more cyan as well. Possibly. Would it look better the other way? Mm. I think blue's good for the sort of like nighttime effect. I think that that would work okay. We'll get a little bit of the magenta in, like we'll take away some of the, the, uh, the green there. So that's it on one layer. We've got a layer that looks like that. We've got a normal layer and we've now got a, a background that's a bit more saturated. So that should make for a little bit more of an interesting compilation. And I think that on the whole, it has done that a little bit. I may just play around with my opacity a little bit more and just see the results of that. Hmm. Looks busy enough, that's fine. Okay, so when you're relatively happy with what you've done, you can flatten your image, and I feel like it's better to save the levels and things like that for after you've done that. So anything tonal, I feel like it's better after the image has been flattened. Um, Colour-wise, we may go into it a little bit, but anything tonal, there's no point in doing it on the separate layers. You find that it has more impact when you do it like here, because we're now dealing with one image rather than several individual components. I'm pretty happy with that. That's not looking too bad. And if we look back at Stephanie Young's work, you can see the image is relatively sharp. So I may go into my filter menu and I may go to sharpen and smart sharpen. Something that I have used before in these tutorials. Let's see what it looks like before and after. Yeah, we don't want to kind of like over egg the pudding. So I'm just going to kind of like up the radius and up the amount just a tiny bit more. And that should do. Okay. So maybe all that's left to do let's maybe try brightness contrast we'll see what impact up in the contrast has okay good some of you might say that well you know in normal photographs wouldn't you kind of want to reduce the contrast and keep it quite subtle well yeah you would but in this case we're going for a more distorted image and an image that kind of um kind of makes the viewer feel a little bit more disorientated so actually adding more contrast adds to that effect uh, so i'm actually going to keep this as my final image now i'm relatively happy with that and i feel like it is a good reflection of stephanie young's work let's maybe take a step back and have a look at some more let's have a look at maybe your other times square one and let's have a look at mine yeah what's nice is you can still see some of the little details in the foreground okay for an old image that was taken on a pretty bad quality phone I feel like that's a good final result okay so let's now maybe have a look at the same sort of technique but maybe with my bartender images um, a good reference for kind of people moving as we saw before was Harold Edgerton and he worked a lot with black and white so I decided to use black and white for a lot of this but the I couldn't be helped tempted by the use of the color pop there which I'll show you in a minute why Okay, so what I'm going to do is, if you didn't understand what I was doing before, I'm going to be copying and pasting these images on top of each other using Control A to select all, Control C to copy, and Control V to paste. And as you can see, I've now got three layers. Um, let's reduce the opacity there. And again. Because I'm not really working with colour yet, I'm not going to do it on my separate layers. However, as you can see, because this was, again, on a very old camera phone, uh, and it's a video file, the, the quality is nowhere near as good. But I kind of like that about this. Uh, there's actually something quite, um, quite interesting about it that adds to that feeling of movement. If I zoom in, as you can see, it's you know will be relatively pixelated to a point, but... I think that's okay for a distortion type image. It's not a not a big deal. Right, so let's go, let's make this black and white. You can either do that through image adjustments, black and white, or let's just reduce the saturation. Whoops, before I do that, let's just flatten the image. All right, now I can go to black and white. Ah, no, I won't. I will select the color range first. So I want this red to pop out. 
it would be difficult for me to select this using the selection tools that I've previously be, been using. Because as you can see, the border of uh, each of these objects isn't so clearly defined. So it's not like I can go around with a magnet lasso um, and kind of and grab those. It's, I mean, I could try, I guess, but it's not going to be as effective or as accurate if I actually just let the computer do it for me. So let me just go to select color range. I'm going to be, I think it remembers this from earlier, but I'm just going to try it anyway. Let's maybe turn that fuzziness down a little bit as well. That's more like it. Okay. Um, what we're looking for here is what we actually have. So if we go to the image, you can see that's what, what it was. It was these things. All right. So when you do this, you're going to obviously pick up some unwanted um, unwanted things as well. And we can check that with Refine Edge. We're just going to have to use our quick select to just sort of deselect these areas. Um, I will do that. I will then uh, inverse my selection to select everything but those those red things. And I am now going to uh, go to black and white. Okay. And I will then inverse it back, control shift and I or select inverse. And I'm gonna up the saturation of these things here. All right. The reason why I like these things is because I felt like it offered um, like a nice, interesting sort of leading line towards uh, the main action that is going on in this photograph, which is me juggling a load of shot glasses maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, before I deselect it, actually, I just want to go back and I maybe want to up the contrast just like I did in my previous um, my previous example. That is perhaps a little bit too much. Maybe levels isn't as appropriate. I think I might genuinely use brightness and contrast again. Just That might be a little bit more of a simpler way of doing it. Yeah, that's good. The brightness a little bit. And there we go. There is my final result. If I deselect, we have uh, a multiple exposure image that now features movements. Some might say that the uh, the vision kind of represents those that might be might have been watching it at the time, might have had a few too many drinks in the afternoon. But there we go. Okay, so I now have an image built from this. I now have an image that is built from these that represents a bit more like Stephanie Young's work. And I'm at last going to show you how to just cut out separate elements uh, to, to kind of like to get these on. So I'm just going to go back a little bit in my um, in my my work there. So we can see we've got the individual cutouts on there instead of like the overall thing. And how you just do that, you just want to go to a separate image file, making sure that it's a slightly different angle to what it was before. Um, you just would use whatever selection technique you felt necessary. In this instance, I thought it was fine to just um, to just select the background. Um, and then sort of like refine it a little bit, inverse it so that it would be only the monuments and not the background. Um, and there we go. That's how I kind of like got that selection there after refining my edge. Very important that you do refine your edges, by the way, and just play around with these values so you can get something that's sort of worth. And let me just, oh, whoops. <laughs> Let's not paste that in. I need to actually do the selection properly here. There you go. There you go. And when you paste it in, you will see that the images are probably of different sizes. That's not a problem. You just make sure that you, you zoom out, you transform it, just like in the last video with the cutouts, holding down the shift button on the keyboard. Okay. Uh, when that's in there, that's all well and good. You then just want to kind of like reduce the opacity just like you did. And there you go. You've got a slightly more confusing uh, image. Now, what you might have seen before is that I had part of this background selected. And if you don't have enough images to work with, I find that this effect is also good. You can just essentially do multiple exposure using a single image, uh, which is kind of what I did here. In fact, let's use my technique before I selected the background instead. Wonderful. 
Let's remove this little bit here using the straight selector. Right, refine my edge. Sorry. Refine my edge. That's good enough just for the sake of this video. So you want to copy and paste this. And what you can do is then you can move it around and make it bigger and smaller. And that creates the illusion that you've taken the photograph from a slightly different angle. Um, and it allows you to kind of get that feeling of movement on there. So let's now play around with these opacities and we will end up with a final image that kind of is a little bit more confusing than it was before. As you can see, this technique is really simple, uh, but I, I genuinely think that it's quite effective. I really like it. Uh, students uh, really like this because it kind of teaches them about layers. Um, and if you, you're new to teaching photography and Photoshop, uh, I would highly recommend that you start with something like this. It also teaches them the value of kind of like flipping and transforming things, but yeah. Um, maybe just play around with it level values on this one, why not? Right, so, good thing uh, is with these types of images, there is no kind of like right or wrong way of doing it. They're just supposed to look muddled, they're supposed to look a little bit confusing, disorientating, um, and, you know, generally with images like Stephanie Young, where you particularly want to make things look busy, certainly be increasing the contrast. If you're doing movement and you're dealing with people as a little concluder, just make sure that it is like screenshots of very, very slight movements uh, in between. And it's quite good if you, if you make use of video files as well, even if they are on a, on a very old phone. Um, okay, that's it from me for today. Thanks very much. Um, I hope you enjoy kind of recreating your own multiple exposure techniques. And if you have any questions, as per usual, just put them in the comments. All right, thanks very much. Bye-bye.